Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, o Master who loves mankind, illuminate our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of your holy scriptures. Instill in us also the fear of your blessed commandments, that we may overcome all carnal desires, entering upon a spiritual life, and understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ God, and to you we give glory together with your eternal Father and your all-holy, gracious, and life-giving Spirit, both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dr. Smith, wonderful to be with you. Uh, wonderful to have you back. Great to be back. Uh, so last week, if you were here last week, and I know many of you were, although we have a few new folks coming in tonight as well, we did a Bible study going over the Gospel of Luke. And what Father Hezekiah and the Institute has asked me to do is focus particularly on this theme of the kingdom of God. And that is exactly what we're going to do tonight. So let's pick it up. Uh, last week, we talked a lot about uh, the authorship of Luke uh, and a number of other uh, introductory issues. Um, and we looked at a few key passages from the book of Daniel to help us understand in, in a biblical sense, where this idea of kingdom comes from. Now, and that was very fascinating. Tonight, what we're going to do is try to turn to as many as possible. We may not be able to do all the ones that I have on deck, but we will do as many as possible. So let's start with Luke chapter 6. And in Luke chapter 6, we have one of our first kingdom sayings that we want to look at. Of course, Jesus' ministry, the public ministry, begins where? begins in Luke chapter 4 and in Nazareth, and that's where we left off last week. So let's move a couple chapters ahead and look at chapter 6 in verse 20. In fact, go back up, if you would, to verse 17, because I want to point something out. Uh, let's read verse 17 through uh, 20 of Luke 6. And it says, and he came down with them and stood on a level place. Now, underline that passage or put a little asterisk, because I'm going to explain something about this in just a moment. He came to it, stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. That means that there were people there who were both Jews and Gentiles uh, because Tyre and Sidon came up earlier. In fact, we were looking at this last week, if you recall, where Jesus kind of lays down a challenge to those in Nazareth by mentioning two miracles that are done in the Old Testament outside of uh, the land of Israel, in, in these particular lands, in fact. And he's talking about miracles that were done by Elijah and Elisha in times when God's people's hearts were hardened in the Old Testament against him. And I'd made the point of saying that Jesus uses that example in his inaugural sermon in Luke 4 to challenge God's own people to live up to their potential as God's people, to embrace him, to em embrace the love of God, and uh, to not let their hearts grow cold. And that's the very reasons that, um, in fact, the, the prophets of Elijah and Elisha moved out beyond the lands of Israel. So we have those people there, as well as people from the greater region of Judea and from the city of Jerusalem. Uh, and they came, uh, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. That's Luke's way of really talking about Jesus' exorcistic ministry, right? His casting out of demons. Um, and verse 19, And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came forth from him and healed them all. We all are familiar with that passage, and we looked at that last week, right, of uh, the woman, right, in Luke chapter 8, 
We were talking about gyrus and witnesses and that woman who reaches out, right, to touch the hem of his garment. And it's not surprising that Luke, the physician, would use a lot of almost uh, clinical kind of language here, right, in terms of describing even exorcisms and talking about Jesus's healing and miracle ministry. But what we're moving into here is another version of the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. Now, the versions in, in Matthew is found in chapters 5, 6, and 7. It's more extensive in Matthew, and it's described as taking place on a mountain. Uh, but let me just finish the final verse here, and then I'll, I'll say more, another word about that. So verse 20, and he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Um, so before we get to this uh, kingdom saying about the poor, let's just try to make sense of this uh, second Sermon on the Mount, right? In Luke, it's the Sermon on the Plain. In Matthew, it's the Sermon on the Mount. What are we to make of that? Uh, you may hear some people say that uh, Jesus gave the Sermon on several different occasions, the one being on the mountain known as the Mount of Beatitudes, which is up in Galilee, and then this uh, Plain Sermon uh, in a different location. Others would say that these are both really merely summaries of uh, various sayings of Jesus that the evangelists put together. Now, for some Catholics, that is kind of a, a, a bit problematic because it maybe supposes too much editing um, on the part of the evangelist. But to be clear, uh, the Catholic faith does not adjudicate, the catechism does not adjudicate as to whether the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain were necessarily given all at one time, although that is the soundest tradition. The Catechism allows very much for the evangelists to be true authors. And I want you to write down that term in your notes, um, if you can, true authors, because it's a term that Dei Verbum uses. What does it mean by, by true authors? Well, it means that the evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are genuine human authors. One of the great distinctions between um, our understanding of Scripture as Catholics and, for example, how Muslims understand the reception of the Quran is vastly different. We're certainly not here tonight to talk about the Quran, but since I brought it up, I would, I would maybe make this point that in the, uh, the tradition of Islam, it is one man who receives the whole tradition of the Quran. That man is, of course, the prophet Muhammad. And the, um, the story according to the Quran and from Islamic tradition is that Allah, the Arabic name for God, communicates this new vision to his prophet Muhammad through the angel Gabriel, who delivers the message to him. And he actually receives it, uh, tradition says, in Jerusalem. And then it's given to him in the Arabic language. And so what you have is a vision of one man in sort of an ecstatic, ecstatic vision, writing down like almost a, secret, a divine secretary, you might say, the words of Allah. So it's one man as opposed to the many, many authors, right, of the New Testament. And then it is really more his role is very narrowly confined to something like a re recorder or even stenographer. That is not the Catholic view. So whether or not you accept the proposal that the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain were a composite of many of Jesus' sayings that Matthew and Luke put together for us in one place, or whether you take the more traditional view that, yes, Jesus gave this sermon on the Mount of Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Plain in an unknown location on two different occasions, both of those are in the Catholic purview of orthodoxy. Uh, we can prefer one or the other, and that's fine. We don't, I'm, I'm not here to push you in one direction or the other. I'm simply trying to talk about how we as Catholics understand the role of the human authors. Last week, we talked a lot about Luke as a historian. Uh, but tonight, we're really, I guess, these remarks are, are really about Luke, the author, the true author. Um, Dave Verbum was very careful to talk about the evangelists as true authors. Otherwise, what happens is we diminish the role of the human authors to the level of what would be on, the, uh, on par with Islam, where they're really only the role of the secretary. But God loves us too much, and he desires us too much to limit the human dimension. Our faith is a truly incarnational faith. As Bishop Barron likes to say, 
Christianity is an embodied experience. And so God entrusts his message through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So it is, of course, the Holy Spirit who's the ultimate author who guarantees and preserves everything that's in so that nothing is in that God does not want in and everything that he does want recorded is recorded. But it's not in this robotic or mechanical sense of uh, simply a stenographer. And yet I meet a lot of Catholics who I think to protect God's authorship, you might say, often diminish the role of the evangelist. And we ought not to do that. That was, it's not the, uh, the theology of Dei Verbum or of Vatican II or of our church. Okay, so with that in mind, we can say uh, there's, there are several possibilities that Jesus gave this sermon on several different locations. Let's follow the traditional belief that Jesus gave this apart from and distinct from the Sermon on the Mount. As I said, it's shorter, it's more concise. Uh, we don't have the full list of every saying that's in uh, the version in Matthew. But what is here certainly gives us a lot of indication of what Jesus desires of his disciples and how they are to follow him and to imitate him. So what about the saying in Luke 6, verse uh, 20? Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Um, certainly on a pastoral level, uh, our Pope, Pope Francis, has been really hitting this theme, and I would say it's the master theme so far of his pontificate, this idea of remembering the poor and loving the poor as Christ loved the poor. Uh, on the level of, uh, of Luke's gospel, there's several things I'd point out. First, you may have seen translations that bring it up to date by saying, happy uh, are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are you that hunger now. Um, and I sort of have um, mixed feelings about that particular term. Uh, it certainly fits, but I think it's a less appropriate translation because at least on a cultural level, happiness tends to be something for many people that is fleeting, right? Happiness is often described as an emotion or as a feeling. So we want to try to dial into what this word blessed means. The Greek word is makrios, M-A-K. R-I-O-S, makrios. And what we would say about this word makrios is that where happiness is fleeting, this word makrios or makarios is something that really means blessed into the age. So rather than being something that is temporal or passing or fleeting, right, uh, like a mist or a vapor, uh, it's something that is eternal. What we see is the opposite in the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes begins, vanity of vanity, all is vanities. And that uh, Hebrew word for vanity, I guess I'm teaching you both Greek and Hebrew tonight, uh, happily so. The Hebrew word for a vanity is hevel, but it's spelled with a B. So H-E-B-E-L, soft B, pronounced hevel. And that really means vapor or mist. So when the sage of the Old Testament says, Vanity of vanity. It's like he's saying breath of breaths. Everything is like a vapor that's here and then it's gone. And the kind of blessedness that Jesus is communicating and conveying to us in the kingdom of God is something that begins in the here and now, but continues into the age because we are built, my dear brothers and sisters, for eternity. And then so he goes on with these other examples of the Beatitudes, which we, of course, know very well. So just to make that contrast between happiness as a temporal state and makrios as a something that begins now, but then carries us on into eternity. I like to say that the Beatitudes are the signs and symptoms of the Christian life well lived. If you like that one, I'll give it to you again. The Beatitudes are both the signs and the symptoms of the Christian life well lived. Why symptoms? Symptoms sounds like a disease. Well, they're not, but they're symptoms in the sense that they typify us. And also there is a kind of suffering that comes with entering into the kingdom of God. We, anytime we come near the cross, anytime we come near our Lord, we experience immense joy, but it also comes at that price of laying, taking up our cross and laying it at his feet. Um, here's what the catechism says about uh, this word, blessed, in regard to the Beatitudes. Says the blessedness and the Beatitudes are the heart of Jesus's preaching. That's paragraph, and I'm going to give this to you here, 1716. I would really 
hope that when you come to the Institute classes, at least for the biblical classes, you bring both your Bible and your catechism, because we're going to try to, to exhaust both of them as much as possible. So the catechism wants to tell us it's the heart of Jesus's preaching. And that's challenging for some folks, because I don't know if you fit into this category, but for a, a certain part of my Christian life, I always had a difficulty with the Beatitudes. One problem I had with them is they seem too pie in the sky. How could I possibly do these things, right? And then also they seem counterintuitive. But when we really understand that Jesus is telling us to live for him, to live for him, to die for him, to make him the center of our lives, we, when we come closer to his preaching, we come closer to his heart. And we come closer to his heart, we begin to see that he is often preaching a message that is countercultural. But when we follow it through to the other side, far from being illogical or crazy, it's actually the only thing that makes sense. As I like to say, Jesus often turns the rationalist into the irrationalist, because the person who just thinks according to conventional wisdom or what's in it for me is often missing out on the greater measure of joy that Jesus wants to give us. But we have to allow him to tip us upside down. Another thing the Catechism says in the very next paragraph, 17 and 17, is that the Beatitudes are the vocation of the faithful. The vocation of the faithful. So in a sense, you could say, read through any of the Beatitudes and plug in that word vocation, right? We are all called in some sense to be the poor and thus to inherit the kingdom of God. We are all called to hunger and be satisfied by him. We are all called to weep now to weep for justice, to weep for the Lord, to weep for those who don't yet know him, and so on and so forth. And then the last comment I would make about the Beatitudes actually comes from J.R.R. Tolkien. And in talking about his own Christian faith and talking about the Gospels, he used a very interesting word that I want to introduce to you tonight. Some of you will know this word because you're a very smarty pants group. Uh, and the word is, I'll spell it for you, you catastrophe. It's E-U and then catastrophe. U catastrophe. What's a U catastrophe? Well, Tolkien said that in his own stories, like The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings, that he was interested in mythology and helping people to see the deeper truths of the world, in, like, for example, in Middle Earth. And he believed that there was a difference between tragedy or catastrophe and what he called U catastrophe. And the, um, the Greek uh, prefix U, E-U, means blessed or happy. It means blessed or happy. Well, that seems nonsensical, right? How is it that a catastrophe can be happy? Well, he believed that ultimately the gospel story is the ultimate U catastrophe. It's a tragedy that turns out for good, right? The disciples go away dismayed, right? Uh, Mary Magdalene is, is weeping and she's perplexed and troubled going to the tomb. And then when she sees and meets our Lord, she runs back. She bolts back to Peter. They have to go and see for themselves. And the world is being turned upside down. But just, you know, 24 hours earlier, it was the greatest catastrophe and tragedy of their lives. So what seems to be something that's going very, very awry and only turning uh, our hearts uh, to being broken open in sadness because the grace of God is in it, is actually turning around and is a reversal for good. And I believe, dear folks, that when we are converted more and more into the heart of Jesus, our lives are also becoming an ooh catastrophe. Something that on our own could turn this way or that, right? Like the rock, like the house that's built on the sand. But when we come to meet our Lord or trust him more deeply, our lives, like the gospel story in miniature, are becoming an ooh catastrophe. Okay, well, one down, about nine to go. Uh, let's look at another passage that helps us to take into uh, account the kingdom of God in the Gospel of Luke. It's Luke 6, verse 20. Among those born of a woman, among those born of a woman, none is greater than John. He, is, he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Among those born of of woman, none is greater than John. Here referring not to, to John the evangelist, but of course John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So let's get a little insight here on what Jesus is saying about the kingdom of God and John's role in it. Uh, first from the catechism. Let's get some insight here from the catechism. Paragraph 523. I'll write that down in case you don't have the notes in front of you. 
And here's what it says. Prophet of the Most High, Prophet of the Most High, John surpasses all of the prophets of whom he is the last. Did you know that? That while John is in the uh, New Testament, he's really an Old Testament character. John really belongs in many ways in the story of the Old Testament, except he's found in the New, right? In fact, a lot of the characters, theologians will say, in Luke's gospel at the beginning of it, sound a lot like Old Testament characters, right? Mary in her Magnificat is really almost recapitulating uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, which is Hannah's prayer, right? We have Zechariah and Elizabeth, who are almost like an Abraham and Sarah uh, couple in the sense that they are barren, right? So Luke really draws upon that Old Testament in- imagery, and as the Catechism says, really portrays John as a classically Old Testament Jewish prophet, of which he is the last. Okay, then it says, he inaugurates the gospel. That's his role. He inaugurates the gospel already from his mother's womb, right? Well, where does that take place? Of course, at the visitation. At the visitation, we can go back to Luke's gospel, and if you turn back with me to the visitation, right, which is in Luke chapter 1, verse 39, we know that Mary arose and went with haste. You see in Mary always, my dear friends, this sense of imminence about her. She doesn't hesitate, right? Do whatever he tells you. She moves with haste. And I believe one of the reasons that she does so, right, by the grace of this immaculate conception, is she is the the disciple of God, the daughter of Zion, untrammeled by sin. So when we look to her and see her immediacy of turning to the Lord, it's a great example for how we might dare to live more like her. And so she goes to the hill country of Judea. She enters the house of Zechariah, who's, of course, the father of John the Baptist. And he's, of course, also a priestly figure because we know that he's the one who's ministering in the temple when the angel, uh, archangel greets him. And then it says, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the babe leapt in her womb. John is already experiencing what, what Pope Benedict called the jubil roof of the, uh, of the Messiah, that messianic joy. He can't help but rise up even in the womb and, as it were, proclaim uh, the gospel simply by maybe making a couple turns in her belly. But he's already making that, that, those first steps in humanity towards his role as the one who inaugurates the gospel. Uh, he welcomes the coming of Christ and rejoices in being the friend of the bridegroom. Let's pause and I'll show you that one. It's in uh, John's gospel. So keep a finger at Luke and turn with me over to John because John is a very unique role John the Baptist, that is, in John's gospel, I call him John the witness. He's always the one saying, I'm here to testify, right? And John is very interested, just by way of analogy, St. John is very interested in bringing forth witnesses. I would propose there's at least 10 different witnesses, maybe more, not including the disciples, right? We have Nicodemus. Uh, We have the Samaritan woman. We have the people who do, he does the miracles too, like the man born blind, and on and on and on it goes. And of course, John the Baptist, and listen to what he says as far as witnessing to Jesus. This is in John chapter 3, beginning in verse 28. You yourselves, John the Baptist says, bear me witness that I have said, I am not the Christos, the Messiah. I am not the Christ, but I, I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. Notice how John accepts and embraces his role as the one who inaugurates the gospel and not the one who's proclaiming it as our Lord himself. And in fact, that that gives him enough joy for more than a lifetime. He says, I stand near the bridegroom and rejoice greatly at the bridegroom's voice. There's no envy in him, right? Therefore, this joy of mine is now full because the bridegroom is here. So we can add that into our bag of understanding about the kingdom, that in some sense, it's this nuptial imagery that John is announcing. The bridegroom has come for his bride. The bridegroom has come for his bride and is already here. I think this is why John can only say he must increase and I must decrease. In fact, the more I decrease, the more he increases. The more I'm out of his way, the more people don't look at me, but actually look at the Lord. This is exactly Another great example, the last one from Mary, this one from John the Baptist, of how we're meant to live in the kingdom, to move with haste, to point to him, 
to get out of his way, but also to stay very close to him. Okay, and then the last thing it says here about John in the Catechism 523 is that it is John who points out that Jesus is the Lamb of God. That's again in John's Gospel. We weren't turned there, but it's in John 129 and then in 35. And already at the beginning of John's uh, of Jesus' ministry, John is reminding us of why Jesus came, which is ultimately to atone for our sins as the great high priestly sacrifice and as the Lamb of God. He's both the high priest who offers the sacrifice and he's the lamb that is offered. What a mystery. What good news. Um, but that's already in the beginning of Jesus' three-year ministry. Okay, so uh, that's a little insight from the Catechism on John's role. Now, why does John preach in the wilderness? I want you to think about that for a moment. Why does John preach in the wilderness? I mean, there's a lot of reasons, right? I mean, we see him in all four of the Gospels, out there beyond the Jordan, right? Away from Jerusalem, in the wilderness. And the whole depiction is as a new Elijah, right? Uh, the traditions in Judaism around the first century is that just prior to the coming of the Messiah, God's Davidic son, God's Davidic king, God was going to have Elijah, who is assumed to have been, right, in the chariot of fire, return and once again announce that it's time to repent because the Lord is coming. He himself is coming. And so there's this very close association between the ministry of Elijah and also John the Baptist. But we know that while Jesus says Elijah is here, which he means John in, you know, is basically saying John is the new Elijah, quote unquote. There's another reason I would argue he's out in the wilderness. And it's one you may have not thought of before. And I, I want to share with you tonight. Let's put it this way. Why is he not in Jerusalem? I mean, were there not crowds that went out to him? Yes, but where did they come from? They came from Judea, they came from Jerusalem, they came from all over. But certainly, wouldn't it have been reasonable to, you know, put up his, uh, his baptismal ministry somewhere in Jerusalem? Well, I think it's logical. And why not somewhere near the temple? After all, Jesus preached in the temple. Why not the temple? I think it's because John, as the prophet, is making a powerful statement and critique about what is going on in Jerusalem. Let me read the statement. It's letter B to Roman numeral 2B, if you're following the outline, on page one. Why does John preach in the wilderness, not in the temple? Because John's ministry, watch this, is a counter-temple movement. John's ministry is a counter-temple movement. Notice that we didn't say an anti-temple movement or a non-temple movement but a counter-temple movement. He's not anti-temple. Um, he's preaching concerning the forgiveness of sins. Look at Luke chapter 3, verse 3. Luke chapter 3, verse 3. And here it says that he went into the region about the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, this is a moment where I like to say, we're, I'm going to write this up here, too Catholic and not Jewish enough. <laughs> Let me explain this one before I get into trouble here. I'm teasing, but I have a point. We're too Catholic, right? We hear certain terms, and we understand them in terms of our 21st century Catholic experience. And why not? That's who we are. Well, let me try to help a little bit with the Jewish understanding of forgiveness of sins. In the Old Testament, and this may actually surprise some of you, in the Old Testament, First of all, not every sin was forgiven, necessarily forgiven. If you look closely at the book of Leviticus, as well as some text in Deuteronomy and Numbers, God freely forgives. And there is a system that he has set up in place with the Levites to atone for their sins. There are the daily offerings, morning and evening offerings. There are burnt offerings. There are sin offerings. And there is the great day of atonement. So there's no question there is forgiveness of sins. But if you read between the lines and even not between the lines, the impression you get is that God forgives those who are willing to be forgiven and come forward, right? But they must ask for it. And there are some, what we might call unforgivable sins. Blasphemy seems to be one of those sins that, you know, it, it doesn't really seem to have a remedy for. And a lot of Jewish theologians will put it among a short list of sins that aren't really forgiven. 
Now, here's where we run into problems. We say, oh boy, well, if there's not a forgiveness of sins, well, how do they get to heaven? And see, that's what we're missing as Catholics. For the Jewish person, the forgiveness of sins that takes place is a remedy for the life with God here and now. Let me say that again. For the Jewish person, it, they desire, the faithful desire God's forgiveness and mercy so that they can be blessed by him in the here and now because there is no afterward. You know this. I know a lot of you know this. Some may not, but many of you do know that in Judaism, what happens when you die is that you go down to a place called Sheol, which is, it's not hell. It's not a punishment. It's not purgatory, uh, but it ain't heaven, okay? It's just basically where when your body goes into the ground, your spirit goes. Um, some will describe it as uh, the bosom of Abraham and being close to Abraham. But as I like to say in, in in the most ancient form of Judaism, when you die, you die. I was once teaching a course and with an undergraduate a few years ago talking about Sheol and how the Jewish experience of God is in the here and now. She was very sad, very, very sad. She's like, Dr. Smith, why would they deny the resurrection? And why don't they believe they're going to heaven? And I, I joked with her, but I said, you can't deny something you don't believe. So the, the Jewish faithful person is totally happy. They're not missing out on anything. They're just not aware of the fullest revelation that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. Heaven is the place where God dwells. On earth is where man dwells. And Israel is blessed, doubly blessed, because they have God in their midst, in the temple and in heaven, on his throne in heaven. And he loves them. And so the, the, the faithful Jewish man uh, is a happy man. The faithful Jewish family is a happy family because they have God in their midst. It's only a around the third or second century BC, where you get these movements towards life after death. And life after death uh, in Judaism uh, comes in in books like uh, Wisdom of Solomon, chapter three in uh, Sirach, the books of Maccabees. Okay, these would be books to look at where you begin to see a turn happening. And it's what we often call the Hellenism that, that takes place in, um, in Judaism, the Hellenizing of Judaism, where they're kind of coming in contact with new cultural ideas, and through the inspired spirit, what's rising up is this new dimension, this, this, this new hint of what God planned from the beginning, but God's people didn't fully know. Okay, um, so that is to say that the temple then is so crucial in Judaism for the forgiveness of sins because it's concretely located in the here and now. So when your brother has something against you, go and make amends with him and then go and show yourself to the priest, right? And receive forgiveness of sins and then you carry on with your life. In that system, John recognized that a number of things were broken. We can talk more about these in the Q&A. Um, one of them was the corruption of the high priesthood. Um, other problems as well. And so John seeing these trends and being enlightened by God as a prophet of God takes his ministry to the farthest place from civilization, the farthest place from the temple to say forgiveness of sins is coming in the Christ. It's not going to be rooted in that institution of the temple as it was in the past. He's announcing even through that wilderness ministry that Jesus, the temple, Pardon me, Jesus, the temple is coming. Pretty neat, right? And in a lot of ways, Jesus is going to echo that temple theme when he says, for example, uh, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up, right? And then, of course, the evangelist John says he was speaking of the temple of his body. So how this fits into the kingdom of God is like this. In the kingdom of God, we experience the glory of God in our midst, in our church, and ultimately in our heavenly home, because this is where the Lamb of God, risen and standing as though slain, dwells, and we with him. That is the location of glory in the new covenant. Wherever Jesus is, is the kingdom of God, because he is the temple, he is our hope, he is our forgiveness of sins. That's one of the reasons that John is out in the wilderness. And it's a very bold move, right? To basically say, hey, I'm going to talk about forgiveness of sins, but it ain't going to be about in the temple. It's going to be out here because Jesus is going to be moving about and calling people everywhere to himself. Another point, does Jesus ever mention the temple in a negative way as in to say, uh, destroy this temple or I will destroy this temple? No, that would put him into the category, I would argue, 
of an anti-temple person. Jesus loves the temple. It's the ways that it's being uh, downplayed, corrupted, distorted that he laments. So if you look at, and I won't, we won't turn to these here, but um, let's see, Matthew uh, 26, 61, and also Mark 14, uh, verse 58. These are not in the notes. Um, both of those are texts where Jesus' adversaries say that he said, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple. Jesus never said that, right? They're mishearing. They're hearing, you know, selective hearing what they want to hear. But the bigger point is that both Jesus and John are a counter-temple movement. They're a new temple movement. They're not against the temple, but John's ministry in the kingdom of God is to announce in a radical way and to prepare people for receiving this new temple that is Jesus Christ. Okay, third passage in Luke chapter 8. And this one says in Luke chapter 8, verse 3, and I think we're doing pretty well on time here. But please turn there with me, Luke 8, verse 1 through 3. So afterward, Jesus went through the cities and villages, preaching and bringing the good news of the Basileia to Theu. I'm going to give it to you in the Greek. Basileia to Theu. That's the Greek transliteration, kingdom of God. He came preaching and bringing the good news of the Basileia to Theu, and the twelve were with him and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Of course, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Of course, seven is the perfect number, so it's uh, in some ways is a kind of a theological image of a, um, a, a kind of a full grip, right? The full grip, you might say, of evil was upon her. Um, and Joanna... Herod's steward, Susanna, many others who provided for them out of their means. Okay, I want to make a, a couple points here. Now, you hear these little summaries over and over again in Luke. The kingdom of God, Jesus came proclaiming the kingdom of God. What's different about this one? There's two things. First, we want to talk about the women, and then we want to talk about the symbolism of the twelve. I want to make sure you understand both of these finer points about this text. Uh, the first one regarding the women um, you know, I had a chance to go to uh, Magdala just about a month ago. I was in Jerusalem with our seminarians, and we spent really an entire morning going through the ancient first century synagogue where there's no doubt Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God in that place because one of his most infamous disciples was there, Mary. And also, it would have only been about a 40-minute walk, although he was probably a pretty fast walker, 20 minutes from his own home in Capernaum. And one of the things that we found, uh, we were reminded of when we went there, is that um, about uh, one generation before the time of Mary Magdalene, there was a, a, a horrific thing that had happened um, with a war that had taken place. And without going into the details, uh, Herod the Great, right? Herod the, the Terrible, maybe we should say, basically took a lot of the men from this village and the, there was a a violent conflict, and Josephus talks about how they were thrown off the mountain. And it's a very, very sad story. Um, and according to Josephus, now he may be exaggerating, but he says not one man was left in that village from the local vicinity of Magdala. And it just makes me think about what happens when you take men out of the culture, men out of the church, or in the context, you know, the men out of the synagogue, men out of this community. And I'm not saying that that's what led to Mary Magdalene's affliction, but it does seem to indicate that that hedge of protection had gone away because the very uh, fabric of marriage was being broken down by a hostile and violent culture. But that's just an aside. Um, I want to talk about the holy women and then the 12. So, you know, we tend to think about some of the great uh, saints in the Bible, um, of course, beginning with the apostles, as primarily male. And rightly so, Jesus 12 chose 12 apostles, right? It's the reason today we have in the Roman Catholic faith, the celibate priesthood following Jesus' model and all of that, right? Okay, so that's true. And then we have St. Paul, right? But I want to kind of say just a word here about the holy women, because Luke seems to have a particular interest in people who are in some ways marginalized in the culture. They weren't marginalized to Jesus, and they also weren't marginalized to Luke. He mentions the poor, he mentions the outsiders, 
and he's very good about giving attention to those who often don't, don't necessarily often get it from the culture. So here we have this company of holy women, and it names them, right? Mary Magdalene, Joanna, um, Susanna, and, and then many others, um, you know, unknown. Um, and maybe their names are protected. Maybe he just has a larger list than he's going to put in there. But what it tells us is uh, that he cares about these details. They played a very, very vital role, the women of the Gospels in Jesus' ministry. And in fact, if you get a chance to go to the Holy Land at any point, I would strongly recommend going to Magdala. They have a very beautiful, um, well, that's the place where the synagogue is at, the first century synagogue. And they have a very beautiful uh, modern chapel with a rotunda. And uh, the rotunda is dedicated to all the holy women of the New Testament. And so there's a pillar for Mary Magdalene, of course, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the women I just mentioned, the wife of Clopas, the wife, the, the, the women who are with St. Paul, uh, Priscilla, and many, many others. And it's a beautiful place just to pray for the conversion of young women, for religious, and also for to give thanks for our grandmothers, mothers, women of faith, and to pray for a, a deeper sense of faith among women and our own culture. And many today, unfortunately, feel marginalized from the church as if they do not have a role, and certainly we know that's not the case. The greatest disciple of all, the greatest disciple of all time was a woman. Amen? Okay, um, so just wanted to say that about the women there, and they funded the ministry, right? I mean, just in a human sense, it's, it needed to be funded. They needed food, they needed transportation, and although it was modest, they needed to do it, and in various places in the Gospels, we learned that it was they who basically funded and cooked and and are the unsung heroes in many ways. So thanks be to God for these holy women. But now the 12. Um, why, what is so significant about the 12? We hear in Luke chapter 8, the 12 were with him. The 12 were with him. Well, I think every Sunday school kid worth their salt knows the basic answer. Jesus chose 12 apostles because there were 12 tribes of Israel. And I always like to say right answer, but not deep enough. That's the right answer. Um, but the, uh, there's a couple things that need to be mentioned. First, uh, Jesus is not programmatic about, about it. In other words, I don't think that there's any literal sense in which we have one of the, uh, each one of the 12 tribes represented by Peter, James, John, and so on, right? It doesn't seem to work that way at all, right? That doesn't seem to be the case. But symbolically, what he's doing is constituting in the apostles the new Israel, the new Israel. And we're going to get more into this probably coming up after the break about how Luke is very interested in proclaiming that Jesus is the Davidic king. We'll talk more about this. And so the 12 represents a major symbol because we go from the 12 tribes back in ancient Israel to ultimately one united nation built of 12 tribes from whom emerges the king of all 12 tribes, the king of Israel, who is David. And more than any figure in the Old Testament, more than any, Luke is very, very invested in comparisons between King David and our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll show you some of the particulars that makes it very plain that this is exactly what Luke is doing. But so with the 12, Jesus is recapitulating Israel around, around himself. If that's the case, and if we want to write this down, that the apostles and the church are the new Israel, then who's the leader of the new Israel? Well, of course, that's the new Moses. So in a sense, we have a couple of figures that we need to think about when we read Luke's gospel. Certainly, King David and his instrumental role in Judaism, but also before him, Moses. Both of those figures are instrumental to our deeper understanding of Luke's gospel. With Moses, it's this idea that Jesus is leading his apostles, leading the church out of exile. Just as Israel was in captivity and was led by the original Moses out of Egypt, Jesus, the new Moses, the true Moses, is leading his apostles and the church out of the exile, out of the exodus of sin and death. And then secondly, he is the new David, or as Pope Benedict called him, the true David, or as I like to call Jesus, the, he's more David than David, 
the one who is Israel and the world's true king. And of course, you don't have a king without a kingdom, as we saw from Daniel, right? And you don't have a kingdom without a king. They fit together. So we'll talk more about that after the break. But let's see if we can fit in one more. Luke chapter 8, uh, Jesus says, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. For others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Let's say that again. To you has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Jesus, I'm a little slow in the uptake, so help me understand, because I really want to follow you, but I don't understand what you're talking about here. First of all, what about this business of the secrets of the kingdom of God? I thought that, G, that Christianity is a religion that's very public. It's Gnosticism that you know, is given to secrets and this kind of thing. So Christianity is a public religion. Jesus said, I did nothing in secret, right? I was in the temple every day. So what's this business of secrets? Well, I think a word that we might be able to, to substitute that would make sense, and I'm going to write it here for you, would be the word musterion, uh, M-U-S-T-E-R-I-O-N, which is, of course, mysteries. Now, mysteries um, is as to our understanding of the translation secrets, because it's not so much something that is so much kept from humanity, as much as sin hardens the hearts of men from seeing God in any substantial way, right? A blessing of the poor in spirit. They will see God, right? This is, this, this is the heart of the Beatitudes, right? That humility is what brings us able to see God. And it's so in some ways, he is saying that in his parables, he is going to speak to those who have eyes to see, who have ears to hear, and they will receive the message. But it almost works backwards, um, on those whose hearts are hardened. Maybe another way of saying it is this. If you think of that story of Pharaoh in the Old Testament, you know, it troubles a lot of people. Why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? I mean, why would he do that? Well, first, it says in some passages that Pharaoh hardened his own heart against God. And then in other passages, that God hardened his heart. So it's coming at us both ways. And what we seem to have is a situation, a difficulty of language. I think that's the case in the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, and a little bit of a language problem here with the secrets business. Um, let's take Pharaoh first. With Pharaoh, the idea is that his recalcitrant heart, right, against Moses and against the Israelites is clear from all of the plagues that God sends, and he still will not relent. Finally, finally, when he uh, does relent, he then again changes his mind. And so it's really not so much God that says, I'm going to meddle with your heart, Pharaoh, and and, and stubbornly harden your heart. But in a certain sense, I'm going to allow Pharaoh to be Pharaoh. And I'm going to respect his free will. I'm not going to take that away. It's not determinism, right? I'm going to respect his free will. And ideally, he would do the right thing, but he has within his free will the jurisprudence as the king to do the wrong thing. And if he does, well, we're going to work our way through that as well. So I, I think there's a misunderstanding of language. Now, let's go back to Luke. Certainly the word secrets works on one level. Um, but I think the word mysteries works just as well, maybe better. To you has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Um, now, it is true that Jesus says it's going to be withheld from those who are sort of outside. Maybe here's another analogy. Uh, today, we have many people in the church. It's almost like they've, they've been inoculated to the gospel, right? Maybe we might call them maybe lukewarm Christians. They've been around, but they maybe haven't received the grace of conversion or a lot of conversions. And so they go to church and they go through the motions and they can hear something and not really be moved because it's like water that rolls off of them. I would say that that's a kind of an almost analogy to what Jesus is getting at. It's not so much preventing them from hearing it, but rather their own stubbornness from really allowing the mysteries to penetrate their hearts. But it's, again, I think a language problem. But what he's basically saying is that it's the disciples that he's going to draw in. The others are not going to be able to basically understand. It's just going to be nonsense. Just like when Paul would preach resurrection. Well, what does resurrection mean? 
right? They didn't understand what it meant. They didn't have the concept to understand. Either Jews didn't really understand what it meant. For them, it meant something very different. It meant sort of like national restoration politically. Uh, for, the, for the Greeks, it meant something even more absurd. It meant like a Night of the Living Dead movie, right? I mean, just kind of like embodied corpses or something. I mean, just nonsense. But underneath both of those is really the lack of understanding of who Jesus is that unlocks the mystery. So very closely associated with the kingdom of God is this notion that it begins very small and in a very mysterious way. I want you to think back to last week. We spent a, a good bit of time looking at Daniel, right? And he talked about how there's a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. The mystery in Daniel was that you've got all these kingdoms on earth that seem very powerful, but they're going to fall one by one by one. And how are they going to fall? It's going to be a small stone that rises up, strikes those kingdoms, knocks them down, and then fills the earth with its presence. That's an image of the kingdom of God. That's the mystery of it. And we'll see after the break another example of this mystery with the mustard seed. So I want you to think about this term secret, and maybe if you have a struggle with it, put in the word mystery if that helps you. I think a little bit of checking in this earlier, I think that would be a fair enough equivalent. Now, the word parable in Greek means comparison. Parabolis, it means basically comparison. And that's what it is. It's meant to be a short delivery system, something that was memorable. And Jesus seems to prefer them, as we know, using many, many, many parables. And what is the single most common message in the parables? You guessed it, the kingdom of God. Because something so confounding, so countercultural, so mystifying, and in some sense secretive to those who don't understand it, is best conveyed, at least our Lord decided it for us, by telling simple stories with a message. They contain very vivid imagery, deep insights into personality, and they could be easily remembered. For all these reasons, they're deceptively simple. Anyone, any child can learn the story of the prodigal son and basically be able to tell it to someone else. And that's the beauty and that's the mystery of the kingdom of God and the parables that, that our Lord gave us. I want to step out to sort of a big picture and just remind ourselves of what we're doing. We're trying to get this idea of the kingdom of God in Luke. It's a particular approach we're doing to Luke's gospel in this series and the kingdom of God. And I want to make a, a larger statement then about this series. The gospel of Luke and St. Luke's intentions clearly seems to be portraying Jesus's kingdom as the kingdom of David recapitulated. Let me say that again. For the Gospel of Luke and St. Luke the Evangelist, he clearly seems to be portraying from beginning to end Jesus's kingdom as the kingdom of David recapitulated. Now, um, I don't have time here tonight to define this term recapitulation, but it's if you been around any of my teaching, um, you know it's a, a term or concept I use often. It comes right from the catechism, so I'll give it to you. You can look it up on your own. It's paragraph 516 through 18, and the key paragraph is 518, which describes recapitulation. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that in a number of ways, Luke is giving us literary and theological signals that he wants us to understand that Jesus and his kingdom is the recapitulation of the original kingdom of David. That doesn't mean it's a repetition of it, right? And it also doesn't mean that what people perceived Jesus was doing corresponds to what he actually was doing, which is to say that although people were waiting for a political kingdom to come in many ways, that's not what Jesus was, was necessarily at all doing and talking about. But it does mean that what God's purposes were for, uh, for, for David and for the temple and for the kingdom of David are being taken up in Jesus Christ and embodied and brought to their fullness. That's why Pope Benedict will say, Jesus is the true and definitive David, or my phrase, Jesus is more David than David. Now, let me give you a couple examples from Luke's gospel that I think make this very, very clear. Turn with me to, if you would, to Luke chapter 1, verse 32 and 33. Luke 1, verse 32 and 33. Just those two verses. And here we are in the Annunciation scene, which we didn't really look at much 
in this particular series. If you are interested in it, I'm sure the uh, Institute has stuff. I have a whole series on the Rosary, Biblical Mysteries of the Rosary, through my website, thegodwhospeaks.com. There's plenty out there on uh, the Annunciation. But let's talk about a couple verses within it. Verse 32 and 33, this is what Gabriel says to Mary as part of his message. Talking about our Lord, he will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. He will be great and be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will have no end. Okay. What is Luke telling us? We all know what the Annunciation means. We all know the hail full of grace. But what about this particular set of verses? Well, go back with me, if you would, to 2 Samuel. And we want to look at the chapter that announces the Davidic covenant. If we're going to understand better the relationship between David and Jesus, between the original David and the new David, we, we should look at those promises that God makes to David and the chapter where that happens is in 2 Samuel 7. Okay, so let's turn there. And I want to point out just a few verses, and it'd be helpful if you can manage a way to do this, to actually do what I'm doing, which is have my Bible like this, like to be able, you know, to flip back and forth, literally the two passages, like with a bookmark, because I want you to kind of look at both at the same time if you can. Okay, so with your finger at Luke 1, 32 to 33, let's read 2 Samuel 7, verse 9, and pay very close attention to the wording and, and watch for those parallels. Okay, verse 9. And I have been with you wherever you went, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name like the names of all the great ones of the earth. Now, certainly we're not talking about any kind of a word-for-word -word verbatim, but look at the beginning of that announcement that we just read from Gabriel to Mary in Luke 1, verse 32. And the first thing he says is, he will be great. He will be great. And he will be called Son of the Most High. Now, on that Son of the Most High, look down with me back at 2 Samuel chapter 7. So we're just going to stay in the same chapter here, very simple. But now verses 12 and 13. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down, God says to David through the prophet Nathan, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring. Literally, that's your son, right? He says later in verse 14, 15, your son. So we're talking about sonship. After you who shall come forth from your own body, making it plain that he doesn't mean a son in some anecdotal sense, like someone in your, you know, you know, your government or prime minister, from your own body. And I will establish his kingdom. So there are several parallels back to the Annunciation scene in Luke's Gospel. And then in verse 12 and 13 again is this notion of, uh, I mentioned of kingdom, but also of the throne of David. Let me read this again, verse 12. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come forth from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. And then verse 13 he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish, here it comes, the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, who is God talking about? He's talking about the direct descendant of David, David's son. Now, literally, that's the son of David, Solomon. But also, in a typological sense, it's prefiguring our Lord Jesus Christ, and we're getting some of the same words that God spoke to, um, to David, now spoken to Mary. These are not the only comparisons, folks, between David and Mary. If I had time, I would show you that in, in 2 Samuel 6, there is an immense comparisons between David and Mary with regard to the ark. The ark is three months uh, at the house of Obed-Edom in the same vicinity as Mary, who is three months in the house of Elizabeth. And there's at least four or five other parallels. So lots of Davidic connections between David and Mary going on, and certainly between our Lord Jesus Christ and David. Um, and then let's see, in verse 16 of 2 Samuel 7, we read, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever, 
before me, your throne shall be established forever. These are almost the same words that we see in the Annunciation scene in verse 33 of chapter 1, when Gabriel says to Mary, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and is of his kingdom there will be no end. So all of that is this first point, that is to say that God is speaking to Mary in a way in Luke's gospel that seems to echo or recapitulate those Davidic promises. This is not the only evidence, though, because the second point would be that almost more than all the other evangelists, Luke is very interested in portraying Jesus as the Christ. The Greek word for Christ, you probably know this, is Christos. And what does that mean? Well, Christos technically means anointed. It means anointed. But it's also literally the corollary in Greek to the original word in Hebrew that it that corresponds to it. So the original word in Hebrew, right, New Testament written in Greek, the Old Testament in Hebrew, the Hebrew word is Mashiach. Mashiach, which means Messiah. So in other words, when we hear the word Christ, and a lot of folks, I mean, I talked to, believe it or not, an undergraduate at my Catholic University, great Catholic University, Mount St. Mary's, but undergraduate in Catholic University who did not know what, what Christ meant and was maybe confused that it meant something about his lineage, like his last name. When you hear this, we laugh at it, but people, you know, they don't know. It's not his lineage, right? He's, he's, it's, he would be, have known as Jesus bar Joseph, right? Jesus, quote, son of Joseph would be how he would be known, or Jesus of Nazareth, right? And so it's this messianic theme, this Christos, that Luke also picks up a number of times. So look at Luke chapter 2, verse 11. I just want to show you a couple of examples, then we'll get back to our outline. In Luke 2, 11, where we have the nativity of our Lord, Luke writes, For to you is born in this city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Christ the Lord. Another one is in 441. At the end of chapter 4, verse 41, and the demons also came out of many crying, you are the son of God, but he rebuked them and said he would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. And there's many, many more in Luke's gospel. And I think I wanted to show you, if I can, one more here just quickly. Oh, yes, this is a good one. In Luke 2.26, look at this one just quickly. In Luke 2.26, it says that, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. This is Simeon, right, in the presentation scene. It had been revealed to Simeon by the Holy Spirit that he, Simeon, should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And that term, Lord's Christ, is applied in the Old Testament only to David. Um, we'll turn to a passage, and I'll show you in just a moment. But in Luke 9, verse 20, is the term, similar term, Christ of God. Luke 9, verse 20, it says, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, You are the Christ of God, the Messiah of God. And if you turn to 2 Samuel in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 1, so now these are the last words of David, the oracle of David, the son of Jesse, the oracle of the man who was raised on high, the Christ of God of Jacob. Now you're saying, I know it says anointed, but that's just the English translation. If you can go back to it, right? It's in the Greek uh, or the Septuagint of the Old Testament Greek, it would be Christos of God. Christos to Theo, Christ of God. It's the same, same phrase that's used in Luke chapter 9. Um, anointed is just an English word supplied for the word in Greek, Christos, okay? The, the idea just is to see here that there's a correspondence both in the Hebrew concept of Mashiach and in, then in the Greek Old Testament as corresponds to Luke's gospel. So what are we to make of this? Well, I think what we're to make of it is through the Holy Spirit, Luke is giving us almost in a blow-by-blow -blow fashion, the fulfillment of these Davidic hopes and saying it has arrived in Jesus Christ. Luke understands 
in some ways, I would almost argue in a human sense deeper than the other evangelists, the necessity for the audience, for the church to make this connection between the son of, between David and Jesus, the son of David. It's not just that they're related. It's not just that fulfillment is happening. It's a full out recapitulation so that all the things that God promised to David are now blossoming in Jesus Christ, but in a way that were are unprecedented and never happened in reality in David's own time because David was a mere human man. So the promises that God made to David were both for the short term and then also into eternity through Jesus Christ. So I know I threw a lot of scripture at you there, but take a look at a few of them. The last one I gave you is 2 Samuel 23, verse 1, the final words of David, and that corresponds exactly, word for word in the Greek, with Luke 9, verse 20, okay? So let's now go back from the zooming out and zoom back into our examples, um, because we're trying to go through as many uh, passages in the New Testament and learn different facets of the kingdom. So we're up to... Um, we're up to page two. <laughs> That's the laugh. We're up to page two, but we're going to make some progress here quickly. We're going to speed up a little bit. Um, let's just look at this one. Um, Luke 9, verse 27. Luke 9, 27. And this is an interesting one. Here, Jesus says um, something very strange about the kingdom. He says, but I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before the kingdom. Uh, before they see the kingdom of God. You ever wondered about that one? There's, there's some, some, some odd phrases that Jesus makes in Luke's gospel. This is one of them, I think, for people. It's another mysterious saying. It's like the, the parables and how they're hidden from some people uh, that we saw earlier in chapter 8. The meaning of this is actually quite simple to unpack when we understand what Jesus is actually saying. The coming of the kingdom of God is imminent. I want you to write that word down for yourself because... Uh, um, it'll impress your friends. No, not, not for that reason. But because imminence is a very important concept to understand with Luke's gospel. If you, um, if you go back and trace your way through the nativity scene, you'll see that there's a certain imminence in everything that happens. Uh, Luke will say there was a census that was to take place. And in the Greek, it's this idea that it had to take place. So like when you ask Luke, um, if you were to ask Luke, you know, well, so there was a census, right? No, he would say, no, the census had to take place to fulfill the promises of the kingdom of God, right? Now, if we were to talk like this today about something, it would sound kind of nutty. But Luke is the most sober-minded, clear-minded historian and theologian that there was, right? So he's not, he's not being grandiose here when he says the census had to happen to fulfill the kingdom of God, is that's how he sees time and space. That's how Luke understands history. He went, obviously, through such a profound conversion, probably partially because of Paul and partially because his heart was just rendered open by Jesus Christ, that Luke took all of these human capacities, brought them to the Lord, and the Lord used him mightily. I hope you've fallen in love a bit more with Luke in these last couple of weeks. I know I have, because there's so many gifts that he has that that I know we really maybe can take for granted. His, his depth of learning, his clarity, his history. Um, and it's this imminence that he likes to, to highlight to us again and again, by which I mean that the kingdom of God is now. Everything in Luke's gospel has this sense of immediacy. That's what I mean by imminence. Um, so when Jesus says, some uh, are standing here will not taste death before they see the coming of the kingdom, it means it's already arrived. It's here and it's in his person. Um, Pope Benedict says in Principles of Catholic Theology that the kingdom of God means that God is in calling distance. I like that. He's in calling distance. You know, he's near. All we need to do is call on him. He's, he's near. Uh, he's, he's arrived. And in the, in the presence of the sacraments and in the church, Eucharistically, he's all over the place in our midst, right? If we would just call out to him, if we would just go and spend time with him. So it's arrived in the person, bottom of page two, and it will be manifest at the coming in the age of the church, which will be birth, which was birthed just weeks after his death at Pentecost. So it arrived in his person, right, with the Annunciation, and was made manifest in the age of the church, which was actually begun, right, just after his death at Pentecost. And then he underscores in a number of places, Jesus does, 
that the full arrival of the kingdom is coming with the church. So it arrives with Jesus Christ, and we can say simply that Jesus Christ is the kingdom. He brings the kingdom, he announces it, but Jesus Christ is the kingdom. And that that, that head of the kingdom, which is connected to the body, the church, continues on church as his bride and as his representative of the kingdom. So look, for example, at Luke 21, verse 31 and 32. Very similar to what we see in Luke 9, 27. And he says here something, again, mysterious, but we can now understand it better. It's this Lucan imminence. It's what many biblical theologians refer to this, what we're talking about, Lucan imminence. And it's even more palpable in Luke than in any of the other Gospels. So also, he says in 21, verse 31, when you see these things taking place, right, you know that the kingdom of God is near, or in the Greek, coming near, is being brought very close to you. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place. Now, let's move on and look at uh, a description of the kingdom in terms of of several parables. We've already defined just a little bit for ourselves again what, what parables are. So let's look at, at chapter 13, which has a number of parables in Luke chapter 13. And there's two that we want to look at here. They begin in verse 18 and they run through verse 21. So they're short. They're just a couple of verses each, but you have to read them very closely. Otherwise, you'll miss a lot of the significance. So let me just read them. And I want to comment on, uh, comment on them. The kingdom of God is like a grain of mustard seed, which when a man took and sowed in his garden, it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. And then another one, and again he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. A couple points here. Um, I want to really spotlight the mustard seed one because there's a number of things that are interesting about it. But I will say something about the second one. Do you notice how the first one concerns a man and the second one a woman? Look at it. The first one's a man, right? A man who's gar the gardener, right, is sowing, right? The second one is a woman with the bread. Interesting. I don't know if you caught that. That's another Lucan technique. Um, he'll take truths and present them to Jews and to Gentiles or to men and to women. Again, I'm, I tell you, this guy's amazing just in terms of trying to think about his audience. I call him the very thoughtful evangelist. Of course, they're all thoughtful, but I hope you take my point. He just has so much thought about um, the human experience of those who are going to be reading it. He's, he's, he's in love with his readers. And he calls Theophilus, right, the, the, his reader Theophilus, lover of God. But I think that could be all of us for Luke because Anyone who's a God lover is a fan of Luke, and he's so delicate and careful and literary to give us such a beautiful presentation. Um, another place he does this is in Luke 15, where you get the men and the women, right? You get the parable of um, the, the lost coin, right? And the lost son, the lost coin about the woman, the widow who loses her, you know, one, one tenth of her fortune, one coin out of ten, right? And then you get the parable of uh, the, the lost son. So he's always trying to when he's bringing in truths, right, about forgiveness and God's mercy, like in Luke 15, you get a story that would be particularly aimed and powerful for the women in his audience and then also for the men. It's not a surprise to me that we get the story of the 12, like we were talking about, and then the holy women. We just don't have eyes to see these things. Luke is doing these things all the time. He's a very compassionate apostle who wants to reach everyone in as many ways as he can. Okay. So with that in mind, let's talk about this first example. Um, this is one of my favorite parables for a number of reasons. First of all, it's just a beautiful description of the kingdom, and maybe it reminds you of Daniel 2. And I'm going to write down here for those who weren't here last week, uh, go and get the recording or the notes from last week. I have to say it was a pretty good week. And uh, we did a very interesting comparison between Daniel chapter 2 and Luke's gospel, right? And we talked about this notion of kingdom in Daniel. So go ahead and take a look at that. Um, there's another reason, though, I think that um, the mustard seed uh, scene is very important today, and that is it has come under a lot of fire. As you know, there are a great number 
of um, biblical skeptics, some of which have very loud megaphones. And I want to pick on one for a moment. His name is Bart Ehrman. He's a name to know, I suppose, because people may mention him to you. And I had a seminarian who said, Dr. Smith, you know, my, my, my parishioners don't, 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 you know, they don't hang out in academic quarters. They don't need to know who Bart Ehrman is or this academic scholar I said, no, but a lot of them watch the daily show. A lot of them watch Stephen Colbert. And this guy has actually been on the Stephen Colbert with an audience of millions, 20 minutes talking about the mustard seed, 20 minutes talking about the Bible and how the texts are corrupted. Well, Bart Ehrman actually grew up um, as a, in a fundamentalist home. He grew up in Chicago. He went to my alma mater, which is um, Wheaton College, which is, a, I will say, a very great evangelical school. Some call it the evangelical Harvard, uh, rigorous biblical school, great school. I don't know what happened from there, but he went on to study at Princeton Theological uh, Seminary. And today he's one of the most widely read biblical skeptics. Okay, why am I mentioning him? Because Bart Ehrman, while he grew up in a fundamentalist home and had a fundamentalist understanding of the Bible, said that he lost his faith. And he didn't put in those words, but in his autobiography, he talked about how um, he was very challenged by it. But you read it through and it's clear something remarkable happened when he got to his academic studies. And he had to do a paper on the mustard seed passage that we just read. And he wanted to really be diligent. And the question he had is, is this mustard seed the smallest of the seeds? Because if it's not, then he said that's a problem. Well, he did a lot of research, apparently botanical research bot on botany, right? And he discovered that there were two or possibly three seeds even smaller than the tiny mustard seed. Um, one of them he talks about is the Israeli orchid seed, which is about half the size. And so for him, this truly was an eye-opening and devastating discovery because what it told him through his fundamentalist reading of scripture is that the scripture cannot be trusted. The mustard seed passage cannot be trusted. Either Jesus didn't know this knowledge that he knew or Mark didn't know it or someone didn't know it, but something's wrong. It's yet another example of how scripture is filled with errors. And then here's what he said. If scripture cannot be trusted in one place, if it's inspired, then the whole house of cards falls. So for him, this made the whole house of cards of inspiration collapse. And since that time, maybe 25 years ago, he's, he's like the Scott Hahn of agnostics, okay? I'm sorry. To, I've met him a couple times. He's a nice guy, but he's, he's very intent on his getting his message out there, that he believes we've overestimated the Bible, that the Bible's been corrupted over time, and all this kind of thing. Now, here's what I would say in response to Bart Ehrman. Just a little bit of biblical apologetics here. First, Bart Ehrman might be helped by remembering something he should have learned in his first semester of biblical hermeneutics about what we call literary, I'm going to spell it for you here, literary genre. This is just a fancy way of saying uh, literary genre, which means that every passage of scripture is in a particular style. Is it a miracle? Is it a parable? Is it an exorcism? Is it a prophetic oracle? And in this particular parable, Jesus is using hyperbole. Jesus is speaking in hyperbole. If he was a botanist, then I will be the first to say he's a lousy botanist. Because yes, there are seeds smaller than the most. See. But if he's a parable teller, then he's the greatest there ever was. Now, where else do we see hyperbole? Well, do you remember when Jesus says, unless you hate your mother and father, you cannot be my disciple? I would argue that this is hyperbole put to good effect. Does Jesus really mean that he's violating the fourth commandment and throwing it out the window on your father and mother? Of course not. Jesus is saying in context you must love me even more than those you love the most. Doesn't mean love them less, love me more than anyone or anything, right? Okay, the second thing is, if we follow Bart Ehrman's logic, the Israeli orchid seed is smaller, but guess what? The Israeli orchid grows to be about, and I'm standing here at my, I'm six foot, about maybe five feet high. Do you know how big a mustard seed plant becomes? A tree about as big as a weeping willow. So it goes from something very, very tiny, right, to something very, very great. And that's what we must keep in mind, A, when reading parables, right, 
Secondly, when approaching any biblical passage, to ask ourselves, what is the intention? We don't want to be led astray, and I don't think we would be, but here's Bart Ehrman, who's got a PhD. He lost his faith over this very passage. Not my words, his words. If the Bible can't be trusted with the mustard seed text, it can't be trusted in Genesis. That's what he said. Okay. So, wonderful passage about the growth of the kingdom of God. Let's look at another one here. This one is a very interesting Eucharistic one. It's in Luke 14, verse 15 and 16. When one of those who sits at a table with him heard this, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall, watch this, eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, a man once gave a great, great banquet and invited many. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of that. We know the story of the great banquet, right? So a few points about this image of the great banquet scene that you can read the entire text of this parable in Luke chapter 14 on your own time here. But let's try to summarize it. First, um, banquets are very important messianically. In the Old Testament, the image of a banquet is an, a messianic motif. And not only that the, that the children of Israel would be invited to, but also those outsiders. Isaiah does this in a number of places and uses this image of banquets. So even Jesus having meals with people is not as significant in the Gospels. I think it's Luke's way and the other evangelist's way of hinting at the time of the Messiah is now. That's just the first basic reminder point. Uh, the second thing is to say, in particular, that it is a direct fulfillment of Isaiah 25. Let's turn to this passage. So now we want to go from the general to the particular and look at a particular example in the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah 25, verse 6 through 9, says this. On the mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of fat things a feast of wine on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wine on the lees, well refined. And he will destroy on this mountain the covering that is cast over the peoples, the veil that is spread over the nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away all the tears from all faces, something that's said again in Revelation. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all of the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on this day, lo, it is our God, it is our God. We have waited with him that he might save us. This is the Lord we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And it goes on as well. This is a, uh, seems to be a very close correlation between what Jesus says in Luke, with the master's command to go out onto the highways, which represents those places far, people far from the faith, right? to both Jew and Gentile. And remember, Luke himself is a Gentile. He accompanied Paul on those missionary journeys where he would listen to Paul probably speak for hours in synagogues as well as going out to places where there were Gentiles outside of synagogues. He saw firsthand, certainly probably before he wrote this gospel, some of Paul in action going out to the highways himself. And it would have certainly meant something when he received this parable from the apostolic tradition from which he derived it. Another place that Luke talks about this is in Luke 13, 29 to 30, where he says, men will come from the east and the west, the north and the south. Right? That's his way of saying in every direction on the earth. Um, one of the things that we know about Jesus is his great love for the outsider. And I mentioned this earlier, but I want to hit it again here at the end of our conference. And that is that, you know, Jesus gets into a lot of trouble with the Jews we're talking about the inclusion of the Gentiles, right? We saw this last week in Luke chapter 4 with those, par with those passages from Elijah and Elisha where they take him to throw him off the cliff. Why? Because he's talking about love of enemy. So these parables probably would have been confounding to some. You know, how dare you? How dare you, Jesus, talk about our enemies? What about us? What about these promises of David that the Messiah is going to fulfill? Won't you, won't you take care of us first? There's a, certain, there's a certain parochial nature um, among some of the people, those Jews in Jesus' day, that wanted to keep the Messianic blessings for themselves. Jesus will not have that. And he will also challenge us to go beyond ourselves and to go beyond our comfort zones. So let me be direct and pastoral with you for a moment, just as a brother in Christ. Who is it? 
I bet you can think of one person. I know I can. That's a hard person in your life that you don't want to necessarily talk about these things with just because it just doesn't go well or, you know, you don't feel up to their intelligence or they're hostile or they're too close, they're family. And I know how that goes. I want you to be praying about this week, these parables from the kingdom. I don't want you to feel bad about it. I don't want you to feel shame. I just want you to ask, Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do? Because I think he wants each one of us in some ways to be a John the Baptist. I think he wants us in some ways to have that spirit, right, of the going out in all directions as much as we can and do our own little part. And I just want to ask you to pray about that this week. Also on this passage, same one in Luke chapter 14, there's something very Eucharistic here, right? If you think about it, it's very, very close to the language of the kingdom of God in Luke chapter 22, where he says, when the hour came and he sat at table with the apostles, he said, I've earnestly desired to eat this meal, right? This Passover meal with you. Now it's not just any meal. It is the Passover. It is the meal of meals. It is the Passover of the Messiah. Take this cup. And when he had given thanks, said to take it, divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. There's again, that image. So firstly, it takes us back to Isaiah. Secondly, it takes us forward to the Last Supper. And thirdly, it takes us to the book of Revelation. This is on page four. This parable, like a lot of them, are eschatological. That's just a theological word that means future-oriented, right? About the future vision of the last things. Why is it future-oriented? Well, because the Messianic meal that's, that prefigures the Last Supper in Luke 14 is also ultimately prefiguring the messianic meal of the lamb that is standing as though slain, the risen Christ, the book of Revelation in the heavenly kingdom, where St. John says in Revelation 19.9, if you want to turn there, the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. Dear friends, all of those meals, all of the meals, right, with Zacchaeus, with Matthew, in the parables, it occupies so much of Jesus's thought. Why? Because he desires communion with us. Eucharistic communion here, but we will become partakers of the divine nature, shares in God's own life. He does not want us to miss that. So, so many of his words talk about him preparing a place for us and sharing in this meal. The meal begins right now because every Eucharist is in some sense eschatological. At every Eucharist, when we go up and receive the body of Christ and say, amen, amen, we ought to be thinking about receiving the Lord now, and then also ultimately our heavenly presence with our Lord himself in his risen and glorified body. Another passage, quickly, Luke 16 this is another strange one that I, I, I certainly wanted to include for you here. Look at this one, 1616. The law and the prophets were to John, since the good news of the kingdom is preached and everyone enters it violently. Jesus, I thought the kingdom of God is about justice and peace. What's all this business about violence? I mean, didn't you tell Peter to put away his sword when he chopped off Malchus's ear in the, in the garden? Well, certainly, Luke, uh, certainly Jesus is not in any way advocating the violent path. Uh, first things first, Law and the Prophets is, of course, code for the canon of the Old Testament. When he says the Law and the Prophets were until John, he's saying that John is the completion of that Old Covenant. But now the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone enters it violently. Who has he just mentioned? He's just mentioned John. When does Jesus' ministry really get going? When John's arrested. What is John's fate? John is prophetic about Herod and his adultery. What is John's fate? Ultimately, he's beheaded. Could it be that John, Jesus is thinking back to and telling his audience that just as John paid with his life the ultimate price for entering the kingdom of God, so must you in some way. He was aware many of his followers were going to die a martyr's death. 
But even those of us who don't die a martyr's death must take Jesus' words seriously about entering it violently. And by entering it violently, not that we're doing the violence, but in some sense that we would be willing to suffer, that in some sense we would be willing to have violence done to us and to not lose heart and to not turn away from this kingdom. The reference to violence certainly is troubling, but make no mistake about it. Jesus is not calling us to aggression or oppression or to hostility. He is calling us to give up ourselves, to surrender our hopes and desires. A couple years ago, I had a chance to go to Calcutta, India, and to spend about 15 days with the missionaries and charity sisters and to, uh, to teach scripture to them. And uh, when I was leaving, uh, I met, said goodbye to one in particular whose name was Hilarina. And she was a little uh, firecracker. She was about four foot three and a lot of spunk. And um, when I um, said goodbye to her, she hugged me and said, thank you, Dr. Smith, and pray that I would die a martyr's death. Now, it's three in the morning. They're shuttling me out, shuttling me out of there at three in the morning. And I admit that I was a little caught off guard by that sentence. So I asked her about it, and she explained to me that her mission was in, I believe, Zimbabwe. And anyways, when she was there in, uh, in Africa, it was in a very hostile area. And for a period of time, her mission of charity community was under threat, and her li own life was threatened. In fact, she was nearly shot to death. There was a warlord who came in. He snuck in, and they got him out, and she just happened to be there. And he shot at the, um, back at the church, and she was standing there. In fact... The Blessed Virgin Mary statue was right behind her, and neither Hilarina nor Mary was hit. And she believed that it was Mary's will and God's will that she would live. But when I asked her about dying a mother's death, she was a lot of fun. And she said, look, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Don't get me wrong. She said, I want to live. But she said, but if God desires that I give my life, if that's what he wants from me, I don't want to hold back from him. I think it's that heart broken open to our own plans whether it's changing careers, whether it's making sacrifices in our marriage, whether it's putting more time into study scripture or the faith like many of you are doing here or other demands, to have our hearts broken open is I think what Jesus desires for us, to have that spirit of St. John, that we would let the kingdom of God enter into us at all measures, at all costs. Uh, I'm going to bypass over just one more here. It's a shame we've got to do this, but for the sake of time, it's Luke 18. It's let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Boy, I've got two kids and as a dad, I could talk about that one for an hour, but I'll leave you my notes on that. There's a lot in there, obviously, that I think, I think you'll be able to enjoy and make your way through. But I want to move on to um, one final one, um, and that is Luke 22, verse 20. It's on page five. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, and of course here we are in the upper room with our Lord, the new David with his apostles at the Last Supper. And he says, I tell you that from now on I shall not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. This is the last time the kingdom of God appears, Basile to Theu, in Luke's gospel. And it's also right in the midst of the Last Supper, so we have to do this one. Now, there's a couple things, certainly a couple things here I want to leave you with about this, this passage. First, in verse 19, Jesus uses a very interesting Greek word for given thanks. A lot of you will know this. Some of you will not. So let's just make sure we're on the same page. Uh, it's Eucharisto. Uh, that's the Greek word for giving thanks. The Eucharist is right in this passage. It's right here. When he had given thanks... The Catechism tells us, in paragraph 1359, the Catechism tells us that the sacrament of our salvation, the Eucharist, accomplished by Christ on the cross, is a sacrifice of praise in thanksgiving. We should approach it in thanksgiving, as Jesus himself intended. He gave thanks to the Father, Eucharist Seto. You read the rest of the quote on the Catechism, but let's get to a couple other points. Also in verse 19, the word broken is, is very crucial. There are four verbs that are used throughout all four Gospels regarding the institution. They're took, blessed, broke, and gave. Took, blessed, broke, gave. Those four verbs are used 
in one form or another, one verbal form or another, but those four terms are used in all of the synoptic passages for the institution. And they're also used in the multiplication of the loaves, which is the only miracle that occurs in all four Gospels. The verse, verse 20, poured out is significant. This is sacrificial language. Again, we suffer by being Catholics and not ancient Jews. We don't get these Jewish connections. But poured out in verse 20 is sacrificial language. This is the language of the temple. This is the language of sacrificial animals being slain and offered to, Lord, to the Lord on his holy altar. And then lastly, the word covenant is significant, obviously, right? This is the new covenant. The Hebrew word for covenant is berith. The Greek word is diatheke. And the word that Jesus uses here is translated covenant. The word covenant is actually synonymous, and this is really cool. This is a great point to end on. Testament. Covenant and testament are two synonyms that mean the same thing. In fact, if you go to the King James Version of Luke 22, uh, King James Version, Luke 22, verse 20, it actually says, check it out for yourself, this is the New Testament in my blood. Now, what's striking about this is that this is the only occasion in all four Gospels that Jesus says this particular phrase, this is the New Covenant in my blood. But if the, new King, if the King James Version has the equivalent term, which equally works, what does it mean that Jesus says, this is the New Testament in my blood? It means at least two things. First, it means that these words have a correspondence, covenant and testament. Secondly, it means more specifically that when we talk about the New Testament, this is the book of the New Testament because it is the book of the covenant. And that covenant that Jesus ratified with his disciples was in the chalice, not on paper. In other words, I'm trying to show you that there is this innermost connection between the Eucharist and the New Testament. Again, the New Testament is the testament or record of the covenant. It's the telling of the covenant. It's the recording of the covenant, the covenant being that which Jesus sealed and ratified in the upper room. This is not the, to downgrade the scriptures, to put it below the Eucharist. It's just to say that the scriptures were born in the bosom of the Eucharist. They came out of that fertile ground of the Eucharistic assembly. When we keep those two things hand in hand, word and sacrament, scripture and Eucharist, we will do well to celebrate our Lord's Mass when we come together and celebrate the coming of the kingdom of God, both now and and when our Lord comes, and come Lord Jesus soon, amen, amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Dr. Smith, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. I hope everybody has taken notes and, and Bibles open, flipping around. God bless you all, and thank you for being with us tonight. I'd also uh, invite you to, if you've enjoyed this program and enjoyed the Institute, if you're not a pledged monthly supporter of the Institute, I'd ask you to seriously consider that, and uh, you can make your donation right there on our website. Uh, to join us. The people that are participating tonight have built the Institute from where we started to what it is today. Uh, it wasn't me or Monica or anyone else. It was all of us together uh, joining together, offering ourselves for a vision of what we had and what we wanted to accomplish. So God bless you all this evening. And Monica, if you could take on the, uh, the question and answer period, I certainly would appreciate that. Yeah, definitely. We have a few coming in. So I'm going to start first with Christopher who asks, was baptism an orthodox religious act in the Jewish Old Testament? Well, first of all, as I mentioned, we can think of John the Baptist really as the end of the Old Testament period. So to be very technical, we can say yes, in as much as uh, baptism enters into the very end of the Old Testament period. But the evidence, to be honest, is, is scant. Really what we have to look back to is that sign of the covenant is the action of circumcision. Now, having said that, that baptism really enters in primarily through the new, what is going on in Judaism is ritual baths. And I don't know that I would necessarily describe them as, as a baptism, strictly speaking, as we think of it, but it is a kind of liturgical action. And these were done in what are called mikvahs. In fact, every, almost every home had a mikvah, which is basically a ritual bath where you would step in. It had to have 
at least three steps, and the person would go in and, and say a number of prayers. There were also larger mikvahs or ritual baths near the temple. The pool of Siloam was, lar- was probably a mikvah, uh, and there's another pool north of the temple that was largely for pilgrims coming in. And so the idea of ritual purity is certainly there in, in Judaism. Great question. We have another question coming in um, from David asking, since many Jews, and in parentheses, Sadducees, did not believe in the resurrection, what was their main reason for obeying God and living their lives for God? What did they perceive that their reward or reason for obedience would be worthwhile? Yeah, that's a great question. So the Sadducees, just very quickly to review, are the group of Jewish aristocracy. They only accept the five books of Moses. The Pharisees accepted the broader 22 canon Old Testament. Testament that basically was the canon of uh, the the canon we have today of the Old Testament, which included the prophets and would have included passages from Ezekiel 37 and others that talk about um, resurrection. So for the Sadducees and other Jews who don't believe in resurrection as we do, what were they living for? I would say they're living for God. I mean, as I I mentioned in my remarks earlier, the student who asked me, Dr. Smith, how could Jews deny the, uh, the resurrection? And I had to explain to her that it's not a denial. It's simply that revelation unfolds gradually over time. And in the ancient Jewish period, the understanding of life with God is in the here and now. So what they believed is that heaven is the abode of God alone, God and his angels. God, though, blesses Israel by coming down to earth and manifesting his actual presence in the temple and having a relationship with them. So I would say their hope is to have joy with God through obedience now and also for their children. It's a very familial religion in the sense of, you know, like if you look at the Shema, Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four, teach this to your children. Hear, O Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. Teach it to your children. So as I like to say, the happy old Jew is the one who's led a good life and has taught his kids to love God as much or more than he does, that they would have the joy and merriment and the light of God's presence in the here and now. Now that begins to change, as I said, just before the time of Jesus too, you have this, the passages like in Wisdom, uh, chapter three and others, where you get the little hints of, uh, of life everlasting, but that's only much later. Um, we're getting a question from Terry. Well, it's a statement, but I'm going to kind of turn it into a question. Uh-huh. Um, asking if you could expound upon the confusion of ideas of embracing suffering slash desiring suffering slash accepting abuse from others. Oh, okay. This is a good question and an important one. You know, I, I think that uh, Catholicism is often a very misunderstood religion on the notion of suffering. You know, first, let's just take outside of Catholicism. Many people look at the image of a crucifix and ask why us, we as Catholics, have an image of a dying man on a cross. In fact, there's a great book by Bishop Barron called The Strangest Way. And in the book, he talks about a conference, I think it was at Mundelein Seminary, where there was a Buddhist, a number of Buddhists and a number of uh, Catholics. And in the rooms where they're eating lunch, of course, there's a crucifix. And finally, this brave Buddhist breaks the ice and he goes, what's the deal with the man on the cross, right? And everybody chuckled but they were able to cut through that tension and talk about the nature of redemptive suffering. And in Catholicism, we understand that our Lord suffered and died. And while this was an instrument of torture by the Romans, God used it to redeem the world. So when we look at this cross, we may at times contemplate the horror of Roman crucifixion. And in some senses, I would argue we should, but we should also see how God used even the violence of this world to heal us and redeem us from such senseless violence. So I would say that in the Catholic tradition, it's not that we want to, you know, we want to suffer, right? But when we do suffer, we want to suffer well, right? My wife, who went through a bout with breast cancer and came out of it on the other side, was very buoyed up by so many who loved her and mostly by her personal relationship with God in which she drew strength each and every, I don't just mean day, I mean each and every second, she'll say, of those chemotherapy treatments. Christianity is not about avoiding suffering, as I would dare say, in some sense, Buddhism is trying to to get rid of it, right, the experience by getting rid of your, your own desires, but rather than going, rather by going out of yourself, it's the image of Mother Teresa. And I'll leave you with this example. Mother Teresa was once, you know, taking care of a leper, really horrible situation, and a reporter was there and said, I would, do that, I would not do that for a million dollars, Mother Teresa. And she said, neither would I. 
And that's the understanding is that we're not doing it for or- earthly desires. We're doing it in order to be close to our Lord. We're aligning our own sufferings to his. And in the manner of St. Therese, offering up those sufferings for the sake of the salvation of others. Thank you so much for a great question. And I will end with this last one from Christopher uh, asking, is the Catholic Study Bible, third edition, N-A-B-R-E, correct on page 1434 when it says Luke used Mark and Q as his likely sources? This seems to go against the word of the Apostolic Fathers. Yeah, well, this, uh, this is a long question that we have to try to simplify, but I, I don't have that study Bible in front of me, but I appreciate his specificity. I love the Institute. is that They're very, very detailed in their questions. It's an open debate as to how the Gospels came together. It's a more modern theory that we have. Mark is the earliest Gospel, and this so-called saying source, Q, or Quella in German, which is this other speculative source. Uh, I, for one, I, I don't look down on people who are embrace this so-called two-source theory, but I'm a doubting Thomas on it. I like to see historical evidence, and I yet haven't. So I'm more of the traditional mindset that says that early tradition of the, of the, of the saints and the patristic tradition, which tells us Matthew wrote first, and we looked at that last week, if you remember, it's in the notes, uh, should not be overlooked. Um, and in, until such time that we have evidence that really overturns that and provides a more suitable and logical explanation, I think we should trust in our sacred tradition, and also the witness of the church fathers. So I'm not sure that the notes, certainly the Luke is, Luke is right, but as far as the study Bible notes, maybe the jury's still out. Thank you very much, Dr. Smith, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Monica. Thank you, Father Hezekiah. And thank you all of you. Hope to see you in the by and by. God bless you all. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.